Welcome back, everybody, to Marriage and Kinship. We started our semester off on kind of a nihilistic note because Schneider's critique of the study of kinship is a critique of the study of kinship. And after reviewing the literature as it existed at the time that he wrote that book in the 80s, he's the a meaningfully separate part of human life, that it's more basic than other forms of social organization, and that it's something more than European and American social scientists putting their own ideas about family onto people who actually have really different understandings of their relationships with other people. But... Today, we are going to look at somebody who does believe that kinship is a real thing and who also believes that he has outlined its elementary structures, and that would be Cloud Levi Strauss. So, before we can get started, we do need some definitions because people who study kinship like to have lots of specialized terminology. I don't know what I can tell you. So to start with, exogamy is marriage with somebody outside one's own social group. Of course, people don't just belong to one group, right? Um, you might belong to a family group, to a descent group, as we talked about last time, um, to an ethnic group, religious group, to a class group, and exogamy can refer to marrying outside any of those groups. The opposite of exogamy is endogamy, which is marriage with somebody who is a member of the same social group. So somebody who shares your class status, or who shares your religion, or who shares your ethnic background, or who is part of your descent group. Most marriages are exogamous in one sense and endogamous in another. So most marriages happen outside the family, however we define family, right? Um, because that's contentious. But endogamous in other senses. So class endogamy is very common. Ethnic endogamy is very common. Religious endogamy is very common. Also, sorry, that wasn't the end of the definitions. Incest is sex or marriage, and levi stress is kind of considering them as the same thing in some ways for the purposes of these chapters. Sex or marriage with someone who is too close family to be an appropriate spouse. Note that incest doesn't mean with somebody who is related because there are lots of situations where you might be related to somebody but they're still an acceptable spouse. We'll talk about this more later in the semester but cousin marriage has been extremely common in lots of societies throughout the world, throughout history. So it's not just somebody who's related to you, it's somebody who is too closely related to you. Next, polygamy is having multiple spouses at the same time. When we say polygamy, we don't actually specify the gender of the spouses. So if I had a husband and a wife, that would be polygamous. Polygyny specifically is having multiple wives, and polyandry specifically is having multiple husbands. Monogamy, by contrast, is the condition of having one spouse at a time. Maybe you have more than one spouse throughout your lifetime, but never simultaneously. Okay, one more definition before we can get started talking about what Levi-Strauss actually has to say. We need to talk about reciprocity, which is the principles of gift exchange, giving, and receiving. Because the thing about giving a gift or receiving a gift is that the gift has to be returned. You can't just get a gift, 
say thanks and not give them something back ever. I don't know about you. To me, one of the most horrifying things I can imagine is somebody that I didn't expect giving me a birthday present or a holiday present of some kind because it means that I have to then find out that person's birthday, remember that person's birthday, get that person an appropriate birthday present of a similar quality or expense to what they gave me. And then once I've given them a birthday present in return, they will have to give me another present. And all of a sudden I am locked in a lifelong exchange of gifts with this person who gave me a gift for my birthday when I didn't think we were close enough and I wasn't expecting it. Oh no. (laughs) Reciprocity is very, very, very important, especially for Levi Strauss's ideas about how kinship and especially marriage work. So according to Levi Strauss, incest prohibitions and rules of exogamy, rules that you have to marry outside your group, outside your family group specifically, work together to help people use marriages to make alliances across groups. So I said before that incest is sex or marriage with somebody who is too closely related. Parents and children are nearly universally prohibited from having sex with or marrying each other. Siblings, too, are almost universally prohibited from sex or marriage with each other. There are exceptions. Some of the most famous ones are pre-colonial Hawaii and also ancient Egypt, in both cases with royal marriages. Royal marriages have Often, even in the history of Europe, which has much more um, expansive ideas about what constitutes incest, if you're supposed to find a partner of equal status, who is the only person worthy of the queen? Who is the only person who has status or power that even approaches the queens? Who can she marry? Pretty much only her brother. Anything else would be a step down. By contrast, some societies have super, super broad rules. So this is an excerpt from William Shakespeare's Hamlet, Act 1, Scene 2. And I don't know how much you know about the plot of Hamlet, so I will tell you a little bit, assuming that you don't know. and. This doesn't really have any spoilers, so if you want to later watch the play or read the play or watch an adaptation of the play, you're good. Um, You won't be spoiled for anything. But at the beginning of the play, Hamlet is a prince of Denmark, and his father has recently died in suspicious circumstances. And in fact, Hamlet has even seen his father's ghost, who has instructed Hamlet to investigate these suspicious circumstances. But it gets worse because Hamlet's mother, the queen, has remarried. About a month after her husband's death, she married Hamlet's uncle, her husband's younger brother, who has now become king. And Hamlet has two objections to this marriage that he states in this speech. The first is, a beast that wants discourse of reason would have mourned longer. Even an animal that can't think intellectually like a human would have been sad for longer than a month. And it's disrespectful 
to Hamlet's father's memory for his mother to remarry so soon. But the second objection is that this relationship is actually incest. Oh, most wicked speed to post with such dexterity to incestuous sheets. Ugh, it's gross. It's wrong. Not only is this marriage too soon, but even if it happened after, you know, a suitable period of a couple years, it would still be wrong because it's incestuous. This quote from Hamlet is not here randomly, but because there's this very famous article called Shakespeare in the Bush, and um, hopefully you can see at the bottom of the slide, there's a link to it if you want to read the whole thing. But basically, it's about an anthropologist in the 1970s who goes to study the Tiv people in Nigeria. And it's the 70s, so, you know, she doesn't have the internet and nobody has smartphones. And the only book that she brings with her to the field is a copy of Hamlet. And one thing that she is researching is storytelling customs. And so she's always asking the elders to please tell stories. And at one point, the elders say to her, you know, we've been telling you all of our stories and you have not reciprocated. There's the danger of reciprocity, right? You need to reciprocate. You need to tell us one of your stories. So she tries to tell the Tiv elders the story of Hamlet. But the problem is that the Tiv practice what is called leveret marriage, wherein when a man dies, his younger brother has an obligation to take care of his widow by marrying her. And so in response to this relationship that Hamlet and Shakespeare and Shakespeare's readers think is incestuous, the elders of the Tiv say, you know, he did well. I told you that if we knew more about Europeans, we would find they really were very like us. In our country also, the younger brother marries the elder brother's widow and becomes the father of his children. Now, if your uncle who married your widowed mother is your father's full brother, then he will be a real father to you. So he's like, yeah, great. You know, Hamlet's uncle is a great guy. He's doing exactly the right thing. And the anthropologist, she just sort of freaks out because she's like, oh, the central problem in this story isn't a problem. It it doesn't work in a different culture. And later, one of the women in the room says, you know, how could you have expected her to wait to get married again. You know, there are things that need to be done. You need men to hoe your fields. You can't be a widow forever. You have to get married immediately. And so both of Hamlet's objections to his mother's marriage just don't work. The story doesn't translate because ideas about incest can be so different from culture to culture. So in conclusion, I want to leave you to ponder this quote from Levi Strauss and think about what it might mean for next time. Man is both a biological being and a social individual. What does it mean for us as humans to have this sort of dual nature? We often think of it as a dual nature, right? We are biological beings just like any other biological being. But we have this society, and society has rules, and oftentimes these rules conflict, and life is awkward. So how do we negotiate between these two parts of being human? Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you virtually next time to conclude our discussion of Levi-Strauss.